Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm excited to have Coach Rafael Chilius from the South Kent School rejoin us. And on this week's episode, we're going to go over some common questions that parents and players have been asking for years, and we just want to kind of break them down. Uh, we include everything from talking about walk-ons to international players to different classes of prep school basketball, uh, and if that matters, and much, much more. So it is a powerful, action-packed um, interview we got here. And mind you, this is our opinions, right? So basketball has a lot of different opinions out there, different theories. There's no one playbook. So this will just add your arsenal some more information that you might not have had before. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy my conversation with Coach Raphael Chilius on this week's episode and edition of the Prep Athletics Podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Chill. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Corey. Love being here. Thank you. You were the first, uh, second time guest on the podcast. So I don't know uh, what that gets you. I'll send you a Starbucks gift card. But uh, yeah, you hold that honor now. I'll take it. Oh, there you go. See, you already got it. All right, perfect. All right, uh, we are going to be going over eight questions today that you, me, and other prep school coaches field on almost a daily basis. And they're great questions. These are questions families and players um, have been asking for years. They're going to keep asking it for years. And I wanted to get you on because you have been at so many levels. You've been doing this so long. I think you've got a great perspective. And um, and yeah, let's dive into it. What do you say? Sure thing. Okay. Here's our first question. Is it better for a player, um, a freshman, sophomore, junior, to transfer to a, re- to a prep school in reclass, or is it better for them just to graduate their high school into a postgrad year? And let's just assume for these conversations that we have clones of two of the exact same player, exact same grades. Let's use yes. those for our examples just so we can uh, – there's no differentiation between the two of them. Well, I'd say the, the big differentiation for me is, you know, oftentimes you come to New England boarding schools, whether you're an athlete or a traditional student, so to speak, when you come from a different area, maybe a public school, they're going to want you to reclassify academically anyway to make sure that you can handle the rigors of a New England boarding school education. So for underclassmen, ninth, 10th, 11th, the reclass is probably going to be mentioned to you from the admissions office, not only the the coaching standpoint. Um, If someone is underdeveloped physically, uh, or a very young ninth grader, like my daughter, she's a 10th grader, but she's really should be a ninth grader. Um, I would always suggest that, you know, to give yourself time. When someone reaches their senior year, I think it's problematic when someone goes to their senior and they say, I want to reclassify and come to, and come to school. I'll say, well, why don't you just graduate? Because being a postgrad is the same thing as being a senior uh, that next year, because you're only going to be allowed one extra core class as a postgrad. And as a senior, you know, it's not failing to reclassify, but graduate and then move on and go to a prep school because this is my belief. I'm not sure of other coaches. I have no problem with my um, guys who graduate high school and plan on coming in as a postgrad to get a chance to go back on the circuit in the spring. And if they have an opportunity and still get a college scholarship, now you don't have to worry about why I didn't graduate and all the paperwork and finishing in high school because you're reclass. You've already graduated. You can move on to college if you're fortunate to get something late. So my belief is underclassmen is usually a good idea um, to reclassify if you're coming to a New England type boarding school so that you can take, make that adjustment from the academic standpoint. And then obviously from the level of play, um, it also helps as well. Seniors, I say graduate, do a postgrad year. But I've always heard, and correct me on this, two years at a prep school is better than one because it takes about a year to get to figure out the academics, the living on your own, the basketball, the speed of the game, the competition versus just one year. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I, for some, maybe. But I say, you know, once you get to be a senior in high school, you your clock needs to be one year back and do a postgrad year, right? You don't want to be two years back and kids start getting frustrated sometimes because you're at school with a bunch of younger kids. You're almost a man now, you know. And then um, I think I look at it almost like a junior college player when I was a college coach. We always said two months-ish, the junior college player will probably make the adjustment to the speed 
to everything that it is for a Division One program. I say the same thing, um, especially our New England um, boarding schools. Kids get to school early in either late August or early September, and you have all that time before the season to make the adjustment both in the classroom and on the court. Now, as someone who's physically, um, you know, they're delayed, you know, they're 6'8", 160 pounds, maybe it's a good idea to reclassify a senior and come do two years at prep school. So case-by-case basis. Case-by-case basis. Okay, perfect. Okay, next question here. What is the difference between a preferred walk-on, a recruited walk-on, and just a walk-on? And are there any advantages to one over the other? Well, start with your first one. The preferred walk-on is someone who probably was a high level at the right now is a high level division three player or a really good division two player whose grades might be stronger than most division two schools and would match division three schools. And usually a high level division three player can be a good walk-on in a high major basketball program. Um, given the fact they understand why they're there, they're there to make the other players better as you get better and perhaps maybe one day have an opportunity to step on the court, maybe. Um, so I say the preferred walk on is someone who can actually play college basketball at some level at a good degree, but maybe not at the highest level, but they can help a team get better. A recruited walk on is someone kind of in that mix between preferred walk on and walk on is we, we think you're good, but we're not quite sure. Mm. And maybe again, like my, the previous question, is maybe you're physically, you might get beat up, you know, in a practice physically because the other guys are bigger and stronger. But after a year of being there, you might get nice and strong. You already can play. You have a good skill set. And now you may be able to really compete with those higher level players in practice, not for game time, but be able to compete and impact the program. A walk-on is typically someone who just wants to be a part of a program, was it maybe a good high school basketball player, prep school basketball player, knows that they probably wouldn't step foot in a game at the college at any level, but they want to be around a team and help a team. And that type of walk-on might not even touch the court in practice. He might be almost like a glorified manager who also is able to get on the court as an extra player when needed. So I would think those are the the big differences between the three. So preferred walk-on, if I'm understanding this correctly, they're a high-level D3 player. They've got good grades. They know going in, they might not ever touch the floor. But a recruited walk-on, there might be a chance if he develops with like a red shirt year and whatnot to potentially get a scholarship in maybe minutes. Is that, is it's that possible, correct? possible, yeah. And then the prefer, but also the preferred walk on is someone, you know, I've had college coaches take some of my guys like that and saying, hey, in two years, he'll be good enough to go and play in this conference. You know, so we're going to get him better. He's going to help our program. But if he wants to leave, he'll probably be good enough to be able to go and play at this lower major conference. And so we can help him that way. So it's all sorts of ways to skin the cat. Gotcha. Okay. But the biggest piece for all walk-ons is you have to have the mindset that you're there to help everyone else right. as you work on your game, get better. And actually the expectation is for you to be in the gym almost more than the guys on scholarship because you're going to draw them to the gym to work out and get extra shots. So it's a lot of work to be a walk-on. Walk-ons, there's no glory in it, mm-hmm. you know, but the glory in it is helping your team get better. Right, right. Okay, do college coaches prefer a player? This is a back to our clone question. Same player, same grade, same size, everything. As a college coach, would you prefer a player from a four-year high school or from a four-year prep school? And I'm not talking reclassing here. I'm saying they're the same age, but what would you rather have as a college coach? Well, it depends on if it's a real prep school or to protect Real prep, prep school. school I've talked about in the past. Yeah. Um, I, I would take the four-year prep school um, kid because I'm thinking he's been away from home for four years. He knows how to handle the academics. I'm not going to have to worry about him in that regard. He's probably going to be bigger, physically stronger, maybe more mentally tough because he's been away from home. Um, he's may probably played against much better competition throughout the entire four years, not against, not just opponents, but on his own team. He's probably played against high level players and practiced every day. And typically you would think he got probably very solid coaching. I would prefer to go that way uh, than, a, than a regular high school kid, unless the high school kid is, you know, like a, a really big time player and a unicorn. When you were in D1 uh, offices and staff meetings talking about recruits, would you discuss the high schools and how competitive they were? We would discuss how competitive they were. 
number one thing is, are they being coached? Mm-hmm. Nothing against high school coaches, <laughs> this guy versus that guy, but college coaches a lot of times don't want to spend a lot of time with their freshmen who are whose basketball IQ, basketball skill level, and basketball knowledge is behind other freshmen who are coming in or sophomores and juniors. So we paid a lot of attention to who they played for, how they played, does it fit how we play, and have they been really, really coached and coached to the point where they've been held accountable, even they're the best player, but if they take bad shots, they're going to go sit on the bench. Um, we, we pay close attention to all that stuff. Oh, that's great. Chill, do D1 coaches ever look at recruiting websites that kids pay for, like an NCSA? I would say the the answer is they do not not look at them, but they don't look at them with the same degree of looking at some of these um, recruiting scouting services of people who have been in the business for a long time, who've had a lot of expertise in evaluating kids. The, the, the paid ones, I caution families on those because some of that stuff you can just do yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, I know myself, even here at the prep school, I'm going to go, I'm, I watch every film that families send me, whether that comes through it in the, one of those places or individually. So to me, it's the same. I said, save your money, hold your high school coach and your AAU coach and your workout guy accountable to getting on the phone with college coaches and sending out full game footage, not highlights. Um, unfortunately, my deceased grandmother looks good on a highlight there that's that what they are the highlight films they're going to show you doing your best they're not going to show you making mistakes they're not going to show how hard you play on defense they're not going to show what type of type of teammate you are when you're not playing well so college coaches a really not looking at those pay ones very much and then b they're really not looking at your highlights and saying oh we got to have that guy they want to say first thing i send a highlight to a college coach okay child really he looks good on a highlight now, where's the full game footage? We want to see him play in full games. How does that kid play when things aren't going well? We always assume that coach is going to jump on kids for how well they're playing. You know, when my big kid was going to Michigan, when Jawan Howard was here, the night he came and offered him a scholarship, the kid got 2,000 the first half, and my rules, they sit. He was most impressed by when he was sitting, he was standing and clapping and cheering on his teammates the whole game. And that made him lock on him for the rest of the game and watch and see how good he was. Coaches are looking at all that stuff. Any coach who's worth their salt is looking at all that stuff. Right. In your experience, what do prep school coaches and D1 coaches or any college coach, what do they want to see in a highlight tape? They want to see competitiveness. They want to see toughness. Obviously, you know, the game is called basketball. We want to, see shot making you know and, and and not a season your highlight film shows you're making six threes you know if you're a three-point shooter there should be a lot of three-point shots on that on that video if the best thing about you is you're a great defender put highlight clips of you really guarding someone find someone in your league that's supposed to be a great player and show how you lock them up and don't say oh when we played such and such he had 10 points i held him to 10 points and now look at the film you didn't guard him your team guard him. You didn't individually guard him all the 10 points. So we're looking for all that stuff. And obviously, talent, size, length for your position. You know, Isaiah Thomas, when I had him here, obviously he's small, but he has six foot three wingspan. You know, so he was small, but he made up for it with the length and the size of his hands. So the really good evaluators are looking at all those different metrics. Gotcha. But is there anything you want a kid to include or not include in a highlight tape? I don't want to hear a bunch of crazy music in the background that stuff is distraction you know i oftentimes i hit silence or if it's so vulgar i just turn i don't watch the kid yeah. you know um and that's maybe not a knock against a kid and maybe i miss a good kid but coaches really don't have time for that we want to see you play yeah. what are you doing between the lines that's what we want to see all right for this next question we're going to talk about the difference between and this is for nepsac only right here we're going to talk about the different classes and once again, we're going to use our example of a clone, a player that's the same, but he's at a triple A school, a double A, a single A, a B, a C, an independent. Um, as a college coach, do you care what level that player's playing at? If you want him and like him and he's the same player at any level, does that matter to you? It, it only matters in the sense that what are we preparing ourselves for when he arrives on our campus? 
you know, and, and nothing against any lower levels is that, as you know, you've been in NEPSAC around here a long time. There are Division One basketball players at every level. The difference is as you go up, is there going to be more on every on every team and the teams you play against? Um, but there's really good coaching at all the levels. Like I said, they're going to be Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three players at every level. My question as a college coach would be: Has he played against enough big time competition? Has he been? A, did they win? First of all, you know you can be a really good player and play somewhere and you lose every game. That player is probably not going to help us win right away in college. You know, one the two of the hardest things to teach players when they get to college is to play hard and how to win. Um, and as you know, you could be playing the worst college team in America. Winning a college basketball game is really, really hard, no matter who you're playing against. Look at the box scores every night. There's always going to be somebody who gets beat by a team. Like, how did that happen? Um, so I want to know if they won, first of all. B, yes, who who they play with, who they play against. And as you go up levels, you don't really have to guess as much how many high-level players that player has played against for their career. And if they're ready to step in and not be afraid when they get on the court and practice and there's a senior All-American who's been in our program for four years, are you going to back down from him? Or are you going to take it to him because you don't care who he is? Those are the type of guys that college coaches want. They don't care, you know, what level it was. But are you going to compete against those guys on our team who've been here for a while? Because that makes us better. But answer this question for me, though. So same player, he can go to a Class A school and maybe get 25 minutes a game, goes to a Triple A school and maybe gets seven minutes a game. How does that look to you then as a coach? Like what's a better trajectory? Better players in practice and competition or better, like more reps? It depends on the individual. I say for bigs, bigs, in my opinion, are always two years behind guards in high school because they don't touch the ball. Mm -hmm. They don't have the ball. So if I'm a a big who has potential to be really good, I might want to stay at a little lower level so I can get touches and and develop my game more. You know, obviously if bigs who are really good already, the higher level is better for them. Um, But I would just say um, it just all depends on, on the individual player. Now, sometimes that seven minutes at the higher level is a great quality seven minutes. And you've already shown college coaches that you know how to sit there and do this. Right. Because when you get to college, it's a lot like the NBA. Most guys, when you first get to college, out of the, besides the unicorns, are going to spend a lot of time sitting and clapping their freshman year. And so coaches want, you know, do you have the ability as a really good player to be a really good teammate? Because you may not be impacting the game in terms of minutes the way you would have in a normal high school. So sometimes that seven-minute guy, might be the better guy to take than the guy to play 25 minutes or 30 minutes who never came out and could turn the ball over six or seven times in a row, but you can't sit them because that team's not going to win if that guy's not on the court. Gotcha. Makes sense. Do prep school coaches and yourself included like international players in your program? I love international players. You know, um, they bring obviously to your, to your community on campus, they bring another demographic uh, which is really good. The world is small. And I think kids need to see what the world is really like because you can get on these private school, boarding school campus and have a very, very skewed miscon- misconception of how the world is. So I think the international players bring bring, bring that. Um, what I did learn from the first time I was here, one year I had too many international mm-hmm. players. I think I had like seven or eight and most of them were from different countries. That's a hard thing to manage for them and for your your team, your program. Um, so I think there's a there's a there's a great opportunity to have those kids and it helps them and helps you. But I think there's a certain degree where you don't want to have too many if they're all from a different place. Right. Gotcha. Some prep schools have multiple teams to include yours at South Kent. Um, what are the pros and cons of having a second slash developmental team? Um, the pros are if it's a true developmental team and that the director of the program and the head coach of the top team also works with those guys directly and just didn't recruit them to get them to your school to help your net tuition revenue, all that stuff. Um, it's a good, it's a good spot to be because at the end of the day, the college coach is going to call the director of the program and ask about that player, whether he's on your top team or, or your developmental team. Also, what is that school's idea? What's their development team? What's their schedule? What type of teams are they playing? Um, do you, does the coach value? 
are they moving kids on your development team who might have been a post-grad who's under-recruited but not quite good enough for your top team or a senior? Are you moving the development team players on to college basketball if that's what they choose to do? That's really important. So I guess to answer your question is you have to really do your homework and really try to understand what is that school's intended purpose for that development team? Yeah, my big question on that always, Chill, is can you place all those guys in the second team? Right. I, I know you I can. I'm just saying these other schools that have these, like that's a lot of bandwidth to take on. So how do you see that knowing you got to place more players now? Isn't that a lot more bandwidth on your plate? It's a lot of bandwidth on my plate, but you have to have a really good staff. I think I have a great staff and people who are going to work every day, every week to make sure you're not only getting footage out on your top guys, the college coaches, you're getting your development team guys footage out. You're, get, you're inviting schools that those guys can play at onto your campus in the fall so they can watch them. As you know, Division three schools oftentimes move very slow because they know at the beginning every kid, whether it's Division three player, high level or low level Division three are thinking they're going to go Division one. So a lot of times those schools move slower and they wait till that kid doesn't get what they were thought they were going to get. But you have to get those coaches on your campus, footage out to those coaches as early as possible on those kids to make sure they get recruited. I always say to guys, there's, I have no problem. Uh, my kids are going to go to Kansas or Duke or wherever they're going. I don't have to do very much in their recruiting process. I have to help them manage the process. It's my job every day is to work feverishly for the guys on my top team who are being under-recruited and those guys on the development team who want to play college basketball to get them at a level that is going to be a good school for them that they would want to go to whether they play basketball or not. And if that's a fit, to make sure that it's a place that they can go and play, not just go and sit. All kids, at the end of the day, when they get to college, they want a place that maybe not right now, but eventually I can play. Right. Well, thanks for answering all those questions. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that you think is a common question or a concern that families might have that you see on a continual basis that we can touch base on here? Well, this is what I would say, concern from the coach's standpoint, is the coaches who've done this for a while, we know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. So sometimes doing too much as a parent um, with the colleges is a turnoff because college coaches are going to look at you, is that how they're going to be when their son's here on campus with us? Are they going to be in the way? And I always said it when I was a college coach, all the way up to the kid who ended up number one draft pick in the NBA, before he committed to us, I asked his mom, are you going to let us coach him? And that means trust that the coaches, not just on the court and practice and games of coaching them, the coaches have your son's best interest or your daughter's best interest at heart. Are you going to let us coach him? Because they're going to call you and be complain about us being tough on them. You know, that's part of the process. Are you going to let us help manage the process? Now, I will say, as a parent, if you get the sense that a coach is not doing anything to help your son, absolutely get on, get on the phone, come up to the school, talk to them, ask what the plan is. And the really good coaches, going to be honest with you, and at some point, us coaches have to tell parents when it's not going to happen. You know, it's just, it might be, it's a tough thing. The portal opened up, you know, even deep division three schools, not even because division three is a great level. And that's the thing I want to back up, tell everybody. Mm -hmm. If you play division one, you play division two, you play division three, you play high level JUCO, you're a unicorn. Because the percentage is 1.7% of people who play high school basketball as a senior or post-grad are going to play basketball at that level, period. Any of those levels. So you're a unicorn. Be grateful for the offers. Don't tell anyone no early. Work with everyone, and then you never know. You might fall in love with that school, the school that you thought you didn't want to play basketball at. So that's my advice. Perfect. A tr let me ask something else here. A trend I've been noticing more this year than any other year is just the families getting nervous about recruiting, right? I was at November at the New Haven event where you were and yeah. uh, talking to a lot of parents, and they're just the, the timelines changed a little bit with COVID here. Uh, what do you say to families out there that? or even doing a post-grad year, you know, the offers aren't flowing during the fall open gym period like they used to. How do you assuage them with the current, how the current recruiting goes? It's hard to assuage nervousness as a parent, right? You know, I have a daughter and if she's in a situation, there is a natural nervousness to it. But if you did all your homework and you feel that your son is at the best place for him right now and the coaches are working their can off to get him, just 
trust the process. Trust the process and just trust that hopefully the coach is telling you the truth and they're not dismissing you. And as a parent, you can tell when you're being dismissed versus someone who's actually working with you. And one of the hardest lessons in life is we may work as hard as we can, but we may not get what we want. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you're probably going to get what you deserve. You may not get what you want. Those are two diametrically opposed situ situations for most kids these days. Very few kids who play high school sports are getting what they want and deserve. Most of the kids are going to get what you deserve. And that may not be Division One. It could be Division Three, but you may deserve that opportunity. And you may go there and find out it's the best choice you've ever made in your life. Do you know that quote? I can't remember off the top of my head, but suffering is due to expectations or something like that. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I think it's suffering is due to unattainable expectations somewhere along that line, you know. And it's great to shoot big, have big dreams. At some point, you have to be realistic and say, okay, uh, this ACC school has walked into my practice seven times. That's three, seven times <laughs> since the season began, and the coach has not looked at me once or asked my coach about me once. Chances are, I'm not going to go play in the ACC. But that guy has been coming from that division two, that division three, that low major division one. Every time he comes to the gym, I'm the first kid whose hand he comes over and shake and talk to. Maybe you want to turn around and give that guy some love. Right. I just it put some notes in there. Um, first of all, every client I get and every kid you get is not satisfied. Otherwise, they just stay where they are. Right. right. Yep. Secondly, the biggest poison pill I've seen, and it's like a it's like a weed, it's like a seed that gets in the in the crops, it just grows and you can't stop it, is when a D1 coach calls a kid junior summer, right? Whether D1 or not, that's just coaches doing their due diligence, reaching out to a lot of kids. But once they get that phone call, in their head, the seed is planted that they're a D1 player. Yeah. And they might spend a lot of money, they might go to a prep school, do a post grad year. And if they don't go D1, they're disappointed. And that's why I was so curious about that expectation quote, because yeah. once you have that phone call, kids can never not unhear it, no matter what happens. And you, no do you doubt. experience I that mean, too? Experience that, you know, at the college level, you know, when the, um, when the, you do the, the early draft, you send the NBA tells you on your team, if it's a guy, what would happen if he went into the draft? All those guys want to hear is that one team might take them, oh, even if sure. that's number 60. All they want to hear is one. You know, and to temper that is a tough thing to do. But what kids have to understand, like you, you, you prefaced it perfectly. Any good Division One assistant coach, they're going to do their due diligence if they see your name pop up on a scouting report, um, a post AAU event report, saying you might be trending to be Division One. But what happens in that conversation when they call you is the key, first of all, and then what happens after the conversation. What's the what's the frequency of contact, text, phone calls? Have you talked to the head coach? Has the head coach been out to see you? If none of that's going on, you just got tickled. Everybody's going to get tickled. If, you can, if you're good and you have talent, you're going to get a tickle from a Division One coach. Doesn't mean you're being recruited. But walk me through this. As a former D1 coach, when you're in your staff meetings and you're reaching out to all these kids that you can now talk to junior summer, what are you thinking? Are you just touching them in case they grow to your level and you've covered your basis? Or what? what is the mindset of a D1 assistant when they do reach out with a phone call or text? Not just a letter, but a phone yeah. call or text. Well, like I said, like I just said, sometimes they've heard a kid play really well and he might be a Division One player. Uh, for me, I always kept um, every staff at work where we joked around, I always kept something called a chill box. There might be kids who are not quite there yet and we're chasing the, the white rabbits around. And as we're chasing the white rabbits, I'm tracking this kid to see if he develops into what I think he might become. And then your job as an assistant coach, because you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna miss more than you catch as a college assistant coach, right? When we miss on the guys we want, your responsibility, that meeting today is to say to your head coach, here, call him. He's ready. He's good enough, and he's ready to come. He will come if we offer him a scholarship. That's your job as an assistant coach, to have yourself a quote-unquote chill box of guys who you've kept tracking, kept an eye on. You have a really good, decent feel about that this kid's going to be good enough. He may not be one of your stars, but he's going to be good enough in your program to help your momentum keep going, and he's going to come 
if that head coach, head coach gets on the phone and calls him and goes to season play. You have to have a chill box. And sometimes kids don't understand and families don't understand that college coaches, that's, a, that's it's not deceptive. It's something we need to have in case we don't get the guys we're trying to get. Is it a true offer if you don't hear it from the head coach? It depends on the staff. There's some coaches on staff who have the authority from their head coach to make offers that are legitimate. Other than that, it's not really that there's not an authentic, maybe the initial offer is authentic, right? But if you don't see the head coach at some point within the next little while when they can get out and you have not been on the telephone with the head coach before he, before too long, it may not be a legitimate offer. And I always tell kids to go on when you get an offer. My guys say you get an offer from someone, go on, check their recruiting websites, the, the people who follow their program, and see how many people they've offered in your position in your year. And you know, I, I know as a coach, I'm going to go and look, and I can tell a, a guy on my team, yep, that's legit, or, you know, you're in the chill box. That's okay. It's a good place to be. As long as you understand that's where you are, I'd rather be in that box than nowhere near yeah, I know we had a few questions. I got a couple more because we're on a roll here. Keep going, keep going. We're, we talk about advocates, and I talk about how prep school coaches are the best advocates for players, possibly in the country. You as a former D1 assistant coach, you had your guys all over the country, your guys. Um, so if someone like me were ever to say, hey, chill, check out this kid, you would at least look at him, right? Because you know someone like me is not going to waste your time, and your sources out there are not going to waste your time. Right. Um, how do kids – in America or anywhere in the world, if they're not in a prep school, how do you find an advocate? You know, the people, it's like um, politics, the people who are closest to you, who are local to you, should be your strongest advocates, meaning your high school coach, your workout guy or lady, your, your teachers at the school. Like, you have to have someone who believes kids play well, they play better when they know someone believes in them. Mm. And you have to surround your people yourself with people who not only believe in you but are also going to tell you the truth and those advocates have to be willing to do the work you know bloody knuckles scrape knees to just call people call people call people get you in front of people so they can see you it's 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 a hard thing it's a hard thing i go on my social media i watch every day of parents saying man how do i navigate this how do i help my son i think he's really good um but you have to find someone to me who's done it like you, like I might hear about uh, a kid in Colorado. I'm going to call you and say, Corey, have you seen this kid in Colorado? Cause you've seen kids from every level level. What do you think? But then ultimately you have to have an advocate who's going to be good enough to make a coach get in his car and drive or get in the plane to come see you. Cause at the end of the day, you're my guy, Corey. I'm not taking a guy just because you said he's good. I got to get my eyes on him. Correct. And you have to have advocates who are able to help you get eyes on you. And that's, I think that's where the prep school coaches in NEPSAC have a great strength because the, we know the college coaches we call, they're going to land on our campus to come see you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for those that can't see right now that are just listening, um, you can go to YouTube to see all these videos and, and see, you know, our pretty faces on the screen. But uh, <laughs> Chill has all these banners behind him. And I want you to explain that real, real quick, Chill. Like what, what are those banners behind you and what do they mean? Well, First of all, when people walk into our gym and people do research on our program, we've had a lot of a lot of NBA players come through here. And that's great. And I want to glorify them because they deserve it. However, we are a college preparatory school. And the vast majority of the kids who come here initially are not going to go to the NBA. And so what we decided to do is to have a project where we have all the kids who've gone on to play college basketball from our school since the inception of the program in uh, 2003 um, to have them all, all their banners on the wall as well, their name and the schools they went to. And so the project, it, it's in the early stages, but as you can see, there are a ton behind me, great schools, and it's gonna continue on because we want every person who steps on this campus, who's been part of this brotherhood to have an opportunity for families come and watch to say that we do what we say. If you're good enough to go play college basketball at any level, we're going to do what we say, and we're going to glorify you as well. Love it. 
Anything else you want to talk about that we haven't covered? <laughs> no, I think people have heard this raspy, fast-talking guy too much. <clears throat> you got to save that voice, right? Yeah. Well, folks, thanks so much for joining today. Coach Raphael Chilius, head coach of South Kent School, joined us to answer some of the top questions that you guys have been asking us for years. And we want to just want to make sure, you know, this is one opinion. It's my opinion. It's Chill's opinion. Uh, there's lots of different opinions out there. There's no one blueprint for how to do things, but the more information you can get, uh, the, the more powerful it's going to make you in your decision-making process, whether it's choosing a prep school, even deciding to attend a prep school, or you know, looking at where you're going to play college ball. So thank you for tuning in. If you like this podcast, feel free to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. You can subscribe on YouTube as well, where we've got bonus content. And um, any questions, always feel free to reach out to me. You can find my contact information at prepathletics.com. Chill, thank you so much for being the first, second time guest on the podcast and have a great new year. I appreciate it. And I'll say this to people, don't just subscribe, send it to a friend and subscribe because I'm just telling you like it is, Corey's going to keep it 100. He's going to keep it a buck with you as families. Subscribe. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Everyone have a good day. Thanks for tuning in.